Hi, everyone. My name is Emily. Welcome to Big Questions. This is a chance to ask, discuss, and investigate some big questions about life, its meaning, and the claims of Jesus. Last week, we looked at the claims freedom that the Bible brings, despite and through the rules that it seems to impose. And today, we'll be exploring another more specific implication of Jesus' claims, and this time it is a timely one, which is the question, um, am I only as good as my latest achievement? The Cambridge culture is stressful all year round. In Lent, it's about the summer internships. In Easter, it's about exams. And then all year round, it's about work balance with extracurricular achievements. Plotting through to the end of the day and realizing that you haven't been very productive or receiving an email containing your third rejection from an application. All these are all too familiar feelings at Cambridge. Is there more to life than work? And is there more to us than achievements? This is what we'll be exploring today. Our speaker for today is Johnny Clifton. He is a pastor of a church in Winchester, and he has come up to Cambridge to speak to us. So in just a moment, Johnny will hop up, and after the talk, there will be time for Q&A. There will be a mic going around physically if you'd like to ask your questions in person, but otherwise, there is a number which is around the room on the pillars which you can text your questions um, to. Um, Yeah, so enjoy your sandwiches. I'll now welcome up Johnny. Thank you. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, a little bit later, we're going to be looking from this uh, book here, Matthew's Gospel, an account of Jesus' life. And it might just speed things up if you want to find the page that we're going to be looking at, page 26, if you want to open that up and then maybe leave it open on the tables in front of you. And then we're going to come to that in a moment or two. So as Emily was saying, I guess this is a stressful, busy time of year for a number of you. Uh, you've got exams, probably had some, maybe got some coming up soon. Now, I remember sitting exams. I'm not that old. I do remember the feeling. And I also remember, to be honest, hating talks like this. I hated people talking to me about exams that they were not going to sit. You know, with the the kind of well-meaning platitudes. There's more to life than exams. You just hate that. I hate that. But worst of all, what I hated was the feeling inside Every time someone said the word exam, my insides would lurch a little bit, like butterflies, but but in a bad way. And maybe, Maybe you get that, so I say exams, and your stomach even now starts doing somersaults. Maybe I should stop saying the word exams. Exams, is it happening now? If I said again exams, does it create that somersault feeling inside you? But to be honest, that's a perfectly normal reaction, isn't it? It shows that you are taking them seriously. And it's a good thing that we want to do well. We, we want to have something to show for our hard work. That there's a healthy pride, a, a healthy satisfaction in, in a job well done, in achieving something. So I'm the youngest of four boys, which meant that I was treated with no respect whatsoever growing up. But then I did my A-levels, and surprisingly, I outperformed my brothers, getting two A's and a B back when two A's meant something, And even now, when my brothers try and take the mickey out of me, I can bring out the two A's and a B line. I achieved something. And then we all headed off to university, and we all got degrees. And at home, mum and dad had this kind of hall of fame where all our graduation photos were put on a wall. And one of those walls is one of those walls that goes up the side of a staircase. And so the pictures went in height order initially. It was age order, so oldest at the top and me, youngest, at the bottom. But then I'd come home and I'd move them around a bit, depending on whose degree I thought was more valuable. So I got a 2-1 from York, again, back when 2-1s meant something. And my elder brother got a 2-1 from Bangor. So obviously I swapped those around. I felt that my achievement was greater than his. Now what's my point? Well, at some level it's good to want to do well, to achieve in life. As a Christian, I think being part of being human is to attempt to progress in our understanding, our abilities, our giftings, to help have a healthy satisfaction and pride in our achievements. It is a good thing. But too often, it's more than that, isn't it? That lurch in your stomach is more than just normal nerves. For some in this room, academic achievement isn't just about helping you make the next steps in a career. It's more than that. 
Some of us feel incredible pressure to do well. You hear people say there's more to life than exams, but it doesn't feel like that. Now, maybe you're not too worried about exams. Maybe you look over your friends who are getting all stressed and you feel a little bit smug about the whole thing. But the consistent testimony of those just a few years older than you is that the stress your friends are feeling right now, the anxiety that they are feeling right now, you also will feel at some point. In my role as a church pastor, I spent the last eight years working closely with 20-somethings, people similar in age to most of you here. And over those few years, I've noticed something. It's something that fits with other people's uh, uh, realization as well, that, that there are increasing levels of anxiety and restlessness in that age group. I've sat down with people who would be considered successful on any marker of success you might choose to use, academic, career, relational, economic, sporting. I've sat down with doctors and accountants and lawyers and journalists, high achievers. And with all of them, there's an underlying anxiety and restlessness to their lives. Damien Barr wrote a book a few years back talking about this. And in it, he said, Feeling as though you should be having fun, doing more or being more, is the essence of the quarter-life crisis. Suddenly, 30 is so close you can smell it and everyone is doing better than you. You feel stressed, inadequate, and somehow not quite as good as your peers. You feel poorer, less successful, and less together. You feel, even though you're only 20-something, that your life is in crisis. Strange, isn't it? Historically speaking, globally speaking, 20-somethings living in the UK are comparatively some of the highest achievers, the most economically secure, the most liberated alive. And yet it does not feel like it. You feel stressed, inadequate, poorer, less successful. You feel, even though you're only 20-something, that your life is in crisis. There was an article in the Times recently about this growing feeling among 20-somethings of of never feeling good enough, successful enough, constantly feeling anxious and restless. A lawyer in her 20s said this, even as a relatively successful lawyer who's already on the property ladder, I feel as if I need to keep achieving, be promoted, earn more. I'm a size 8, and yet I still feel as if I need to be healthier, lose weight and tone up to be at my best. She talks about it feeling like a treadmill, desperately trying to run from one achievement to the next. You pass your exams, you get the internship you you dreamed of, you get the career you wanted, then it's the promotion. And then there's all the non-work stuff as well, feeling like you've got to be successful in your relationships, in family life, in how you look, in your social life. See, that's the testimony of those just a few years on from you. Maybe you're beginning to feel it even now as well as you approach your exams. This constant pressure to succeed. So what's going on? Why are people who are on the surface of some of the highest achievers, most secure, most liberated people alive, feeling like they need to keep achieving? Feeling high levels of anxiety and restlessness. Well, I think it's a problem of identity, isn't it? See, here's our first point. Identity built on achievement is fragile and destructive. Now, a common mantra that I grew up on, and I guess you did as well, is that we are free to construct our own identity. And and it does sound wonderfully liberating, doesn't it? It's what my four children hear every time they watch a Disney movie. There's so many options before us. And yet, interestingly, where most of us have ended up seeking our identity is in our success and our achievement. Our achievements, whether academic or career or social or economic, become about justifying ourselves, proving to ourselves and to the world that I matter, that my life matters. And so, of course, it begins to feel as though I am only as good as my last achievement. 
I'm only as good as my last exam result. I'm only as good as my last essay. I'm only as good as my, last, as my dissertation result. I'm only as good as my last tutorial performance. The journalist Polly Toynbee wrote a book a few years back about the pressure of achievement in the workplace. She, she spoke to a barrister working in London. And he said, I, I don't think I could tone down the amount of work I do. You cannot take anything for granted. You're only as good as the last case they saw you in. You're only as good as the last case. I always get barrister and barista mixed up. Do you have that problem? Mind you, a barista probably is only as good as their last coffee. You're only as good as your last case, your last essay, your last performance, your last exam, your last promotion. And it might work. You, you bolster your sense of self-esteem and self-worth through those achievements. But it is so fragile. Back in that article in the Times, a guy in his 20s said this, there is a river of anxiety running between our careers and our relationships that is making us think nothing is happening quickly enough or perfectly enough. A river of anxiety running through your life. Why? Because all these achievements are so fragile. It feels as though you're only as good as your last achievement. So where's the next one? And more worryingly, what if I fail? Look, if there's one thing you take away from this talk, it would be to think about this question. Whatever way you choose to build your identity, ask yourself this, can it handle failure? Can my identity cope with failure? Whatever the foundation of your sense of dignity, worth, and purpose, can it handle failure? Can you fail and still have a sense of identity? And if a large part of my identity is based on my achievements, then I don't think I can. This is something I've been grappling with massively over the last 12 months. I've experienced failure. My job in Southampton was coming to an end. I was looking to start a new project up north. And it seemed incredibly exciting. It seemed like the right thing to do. But the very last minute, it all fell through. One of our backers wasn't convinced, and it felt like failure. You're not the guy to do this. My job was still coming to an end, so I needed to find another church to work for, and I applied for a position in a, in a largest church, and again, on paper, it looked excellent. It looked exactly like the right thing to do. I went for an interview, but I didn't get it. And again, it felt personal. It felt like failure. And the impact it's had on me it's surprising. You see, it was more than just disappointment that I felt. That, that would be a perfectly normal reaction. You know, it felt crushing. It, it dawned on me that my identity was very much tied to my achievements and my accomplishments, and that is so fragile. And this achievement-based identity is not only fragile, it is destructive. It's self-destructive because we can't deal with the failure in our own lives. But when we fail, we're not just disappointed, we're crushed. As one guy put it, you feel worthless when you fail. Worthless. And again, this isn't just about achievement in academia or career. In another article about the dating app Tinder, one graduate in her early 20s wrote, matches or successes made us feel validated. They meant we were good enough. When we didn't get any matches, we felt ugly, rejected. See, no wonder there's a river of anxiety flowing through our careers and our relationships because they cannot fail. So we keep pressing on, keep searching until we slowly destroy ourselves. Identity built on achievement ends up being self-destructive. It cannot cope with failure. But it's also socially destructive, if you've noticed this. 
Because here's the thing, when individually we're all building our identities on success and achievement, then as a society we cannot deal with failure in someone else. Not in a positive way. Do you notice that? If someone fails, if someone falls short of a recognized standard, if someone screws up in some way, then as a society, what's our response? We vilify, we shame, we ostracize, we cannot handle someone else's failure in a positive way. There's only condemnation, there's no redemption. John Ronson wrote a brilliant book called So You've Been Publicly Shamed, in which he interviews people who've experienced this public failure. He talks with one guy called Mike Daisy who was caught out lying in a radio report he did. That wasn't a great thing to do. He shouldn't have done it, and he apologized. But his apology was not enough. He talks about the reaction he faced on Twitter. They don't want an apology. For someone to make an apology, someone has to be listening, but they don't want an apology. What they want is my destruction. Increasingly, we struggle to deal with failure in others in a positive way. We're good at outrage. We're good at condemnation, but we don't know how to restore. We don't know how to forgive. And of course, that makes sense. If my identity is built on success and accomplishment, socially, economically, morally, whatever it is, then your failure only bolsters my sense of accomplishment and success. It is good for me if you fail. And so an identity based on success and achievement is fragile and it is destructive personally and socially. So what do we do about it? Well, I think we need an identity that can cope with failure. Failure in ourselves and failure in others that is not dependent, therefore, on our last success. And it is an identity that comes from someone who knows us, knows everything about us, failures and all, and yet still loves us. That's our second point. Identity based on Jesus is secure and restorative. So uh, on your tables, we're going to have a quick read of, of something that Jesus said in these little books here. We're on page 26. And we're going to look at uh, verses 27 at the bottom of the page, just to the end of the chapter on the other page. Now, as we uh, look at these things, first I want to see something about who Jesus is. So have a look at verse 27. He says, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. So there's a lot of big ideas going on there, but essentially Jesus is making some startling claims. He is saying that he is equal with the Father, with God. He's claiming to be God himself. And as God, he knows everything. He says, all things have been committed to me. Jesus knows all things. He, he knows me. He knows about the best in me, but he also knows the worst in me. He knows my every failure, whether it's academic or career or moral. He knows my failure as a husband to love my wife. He knows my failure as a father to properly care for my children. He knows my failures as a pastor. He knows the things that we have buried deep away in our hearts, hidden from ourselves even. The things that we cannot face because if we did, it would shatter our achievement-based identity. He knows it all. And normally when people find out the worst about us, it, it drives them away, doesn't it? That, that's what we fear. I had a friend growing up who told me of a time she shared something with her youth worker. The youth worker was giving her a lift home at the time. She shared this, this kind of very serious moral failure and that she was deeply ashamed of. And the youth leader listened and then said to her, get out of my car. It's what we fear. If you knew me, you wouldn't want anything to do with me. But Jesus knows it all. He sees it all. And what does he do? What does the God of the universe say to us? I, I can't stand you. You're a failure. I want nothing to do with you. No, we read on. 
Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He welcomes us. He draws us in. He loves us. And that talk of rest here, that's beautiful, isn't it? Remember the line from that lawyer in her 20s, I feel as if I need to keep achieving, be promoted, earn more. I'm a size 8 and I feel as if I need to be healthier, lose weight, tone up to be my best. With an achievement-based identity, we are under this constant and weary burden to justify ourselves, to prove ourselves, always looking for that next achievement. But Jesus says to us, come to me and I will give you rest. I will give you a new identity, a value to your life that is secure and safe. See, Jesus, the God of the universe, knows the worst about us and yet still loves us. And you can build an identity on that. Who am I? I am fully known and fully loved by the God of the universe. And this identity is secure. See, not only does Jesus know the worst about us, he even forgives the worst about us. Shortly after his words, Jesus heads to the cross. And for those who trust in him, as he dies on that cross, he experienced the consequences of our greatest failure, our failure to love God and our failure to love others. He, was faced, he faced the rejection that we should have faced so that forever we could be welcomed by the God, into, uh, the God who made us and the God who loves us. He died that we might be forgiven for our greatest failure. And what that means is this identity that he gives us is so secure. It can cope with any failure. Know Jesus, and if you fail in your exams, that does not change your identity. You are still known and loved by God. If you fail in your relationships, hurting others, you are still known and loved. And the God who went to the cross for you is a God who is willing to forgive you and restore you. If you fail in ways which bring real shame and brokenness to your heart, which make you fear the judgment of others, you are still known and loved by this God. In Jesus, the God of the universe experienced the greatest shame imaginable on that cross so that we could always be forgiven and restored and welcomed back. An identity based on Jesus is not fragile or destructive. It is secure and restorative. He redeems. He forgives. Now, I want to be clear. It's not that Jesus affirms our failures or celebrates them. No, he, he calls us to a different life. He, he says in these words here, take my yoke upon you. Take my way of life upon you. Embrace Jesus and you embrace a new identity with a new orientation to your life. He sets the agenda. He sets the values. He sets the direction. He gives us an identity which is secure and restorative. And it's socially restorative as well. Because when I've learned what it is to be restored by Christ, to be known and still loved, it is possible to show that kind of restorative kindness to others who fail. To respond to their failure as Jesus has responded to my failures with patience and forgiveness. Identity based on Jesus is secure and restorative. And just one last quick thing I want to say. It changes our attitude to achievement. You see, when my identity is based on achievement and success, then I pursue those things in a self-orientated manner. I am succeeding for my sake, to shore up my sense of identity. When my identity comes from Christ, I can now pursue achievement for the sake of others very different way of thinking. Jesus is not saying, just be failures. Don't, don't bother about trying to progress and succeed. He is saying, succeed not for your own sake. You don't need to anymore. 
and for the sake of others. And it means that we're free to enjoy the things that we are working at. I can enjoy my studies. I can enjoy my sport. I can enjoy my leisure. I can enjoy the things that previously had to give me a sense of identity. I can now just enjoy them for what they are. Wonderful gifts from a wonderful God. Totally transforms the way we think about achievement and success. So are we only as good as our last achievement? Well, if your identity is based on achievement, then the answer has to be yes. And that is a very difficult place to be. It is fragile. It is destructive. But if there is an alternative identity, like this identity that Jesus offers us, to be known and loved and forgiven by the God of the universe, well, then that creates an identity that is secure and restorative. Thank you um, for listening. I think I'm going to hand back, and we'll probably have time for questions in a moment. Thank you. Um, just to start with, um, does anyone have any questions which you'd like to ask in person? Um, if... Does anyone have any questions that you'd like to ask in person? Can bring the mic to you. Great. We will go with the textbook questions. Um, firstly, what do you mean by studying or achieving for the sake of others? Um, yeah, studying, achieving for the sake of others. Um, just kind of threw that in at the end there. Uh, I think it's interesting. As human beings, we are social beings, aren't we? Um, and so in one sense, everything I think I can probably kind of back this up, but I think everything we are doing when it comes to career, when it comes to the, the jobs we do, impacts other people. Um, now, 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 we need jobs to, to pay for our own, you know, to pay our way in life. We need jobs um, to kind of meet some of those physical needs. But wouldn't it be wonderful if we were able to see beyond the personal gain from the job I do to thinking more deliberately, how, how can I do this to contribute to the well-being, to the betterment of others? Um, providing a product that other people that brings real joy to people, um, thinking about a service I do in such a way that it affirms the dignity and value of others. Uh, now, I think you know every human being gets that at certain points, but I think with this kind of Christian worldview, it becomes much more to the front of your mind because I'm released from having to pursue my achievements and successes to shore up my own identity. I, I, I can take back all of that emotional energy that was being poured into that project and now pour it into thinking, how can I think about what I do in terms of what it might accomplish for others and, and how it might bring betterment to them and their lives? Um, I'm sure we could talk more about it, but that's a rough idea. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, the second question is, does God think that only Christians are valuable as people? Yeah, wonderful. Uh, not at all, not at all. Um, so yes, uh, um, I think... Every human being is made in the image of God. Um, for God so loved the world, we're told, John 3, 16. That, that, so God has a, a wonder, every human being has a dignity, value, and worth in the eyes of God. I think what Jesus is saying is that um, by nature, many of us have turned away from that God. And he's saying, therefore, we are running away from the thing that we were made for, to know this God. And that has a massive impact on our sense of identity. Um, because if I was made to know this God and I'm running away from that, then of course there's going to be confusion. And so what Jesus is trying to do is pull us back and say, I can give you that relationship with God. You can be known by him and loved by him, which will give you that deeper sense of what it means to be a human being. So we're not talking about that some people are more valuable than other people. That's not what we're saying. Um, but Jesus is offering us a way back to what we were made for, uh, to know the true and living, and living God. Yeah. Great. Um, we've got two more questions. One is, um, aren't there other identities that you can put your value in that is not your achievement? For example, the well-being of a community, like soldiers who sacrifice their lives for their country. What's wrong with this? Oh, brilliant. I, I think, I mean, what I was trying to say was, you, you know, we, we've been told and uh, constantly told that we, we're free to, 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 to kind of create our own identity, and that's fine. And, and yes, there are all sorts of ways that we can construct our identity. But I, I just want to come back to that question. Uh, first thing I want to say is just come back to that question. Whatever identity you construct, can it cope with failure? 
So I think you, you need to try and... That's a question that's worth applying to whatever form of identity that you're constructing. Can it cope with failure within the system, whatever system it is that I've, I've put together? I think as well, what's very interesting is that um, that, that idea of, of living for the good of others... Now, as a Christian, I just think it's a brilliant idea. I just wonder, what's the engine that's going to drive that? Russell Brand, in his book, um, Addictions, uh, comedian Russell Brand, talks very honestly about some of the things that he struggled with. And one of the addictions he talks about is the addiction to success. And he says something really profound. He says, uh, even when I was trying to do good for others, you know, help someone who's homeless, he talks about, it suddenly dawned on me that it was really about myself, projecting this image of myself. Uh, and, and I think... Let's be honest with ourselves. If we're going to build an identity on loving others, is it actually deep down really about ourselves? Because even building an identity on loving others means that I'm loving you because I need a sense of identity from you. So, so I, you know, I, I think it's a wonderful pursuit, but I'm not sure. I think the God of Christianity gives you the engine to pursue that in a selfless way. And finally, uh, perhaps God can forgive my failures, but how can I come to terms with them myself when they are about things that matter to me for their own sake? Yeah, I, I mean, it's such a profound question, isn't it? I, you know, it's very, and really hard to answer not knowing... Oh, gosh, sorry, hang on. Not knowing the specifics of, of what's going on there. Um, I think I'd, I want to say something that's going to sound really harsh to start with, but then, then wonderful. Your sense of... Your sense of of failure, your sense of sin, your sense of whatever the disgust is you feel inside, God feels it even more than you do. He, he knows you even better than you know yourself. He sees the consequences of, of that action even more than you see it. And so you, you, you feel that sense of shame. He, he knows that actually you should feel even more shame to one extent because he knows everything about you. And yet how does he respond to you? He says, I love you. He says, come in, put your faith in my son, be part of my family. You, you can be restored. You can have this wonderful identity in, in my family. And I think that's just very incredible, that he knows the worst about us, perhaps even more so than we know ourselves, and yet still chooses to love us. Just one quick follow-up to that. I, I want to say that if the person asking that question, there are different reasons we feel shame. Sometimes we feel shame because of the things we've done, and, and, and maybe there's an appropriateness to it. We've done something bad, we feel shame for it. Sometimes we feel shame because of what others have done to us. And if that's where this shame is coming from, then we're talking about something very different. We're talking about a God who, who wants to reach out and restore you and heal you from the pain that's been done to you. It's a, it's a, it's a different thing. But if it's something you've done, then the promise is forgiveness. And, and sometimes the feeling takes a while to catch up with the truth. You put your faith in Jesus, it's all forgiven. It takes a while for the feeling to catch up with that, but it will. It really will. Thanks, Johnny. Right.